the lecture two. This is uh, a part of the educational part of this uh, of this um, lecture course. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about compact operators. Um, right. So give me a moment. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about classes of compact operators. So these classes um, <clears throat> divided, uh, dividing complex, uh, compact operators uh, depending on their, on the rate of decay of their uh, eigenvalues or singular values. So let's start slowly from the very beginning. Now we look at the, the two separable Hilbert spaces. So we, we need only this situation. They're different. This is important that they can be different, these spaces. And then we have uh, compact operators uh, from one space to the other. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we always do that if two spaces coincide and the operator is self-adjoint and non-negative then we denote by lambda k uh, positive eigenvalues of t and we label them uh, in the standard order uh, in descending order and counting multiplicity okay so every eigenvalue comes is counted as many times as it multiplicity is <clears throat> um, i will not need any other cases here this is i just want to make it a little bit um, simpler then the general case, you see, I'm looking only at the non-negative operators so that I don't have to look at, at the negative eigenvalues uh, that will be present in the general case. <clears throat> now, um, back to the general case when we have just arbitrary X and G, H and G, for a compact operator T, we define singular values. So this is the definition of singular values of T as the square root of eigenvalues of this positive operator t star t. You remember I mentioned that a few minutes ago in the previous lecture uh, that this is the definition of singular values. <coughs> it is the same, uh, the, the eigenvalues, non-zero eigenvalues of this operator are the same. So um, they give exactly the same singular value of the operator t. Um, some useful inequalities for eigenvalues that we will be um, uh, employing later. So for the sum of two operators, sorry, inequalities for singular values. For the sum of two operators, you have this. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very useful. And also, uh, this is a, a, a very important inequality here that this is true for all r you choose every r, any r you want you can even take an infinite r if uh, the right hand side here is finite in other words if the operator belongs to the trace class both of them <clears throat> this is true for any compact t1 and t2 mm -hmm. now uh, the next inequality that i'm going to show to you is uh, is just uh, this is the most the most important inequality for us. This is something that generalizes this this inequality, and this is Rothfeld theorem. Uh, I don't even remember the date. Um, this is a very uh, relatively old result. <clears throat> so instead of the linear function here, this is just the sum of singular values. I'm going to take an arbitrary concave. <coughs> non-decreasing function such that is equal to zero at zero. So think about something like that, right? Square root or any power less than one or less than or equal to one. Okay. So, and then uh, this inequality holds. This is, uh, this is a remarkable fact. Just for any function like this, you can write this inequality. And that we'll be, we'll be using uh, in the next slides. <clears throat> okay, um, let's go to the classes of compact operators now. Now, uh, 
let me introduce first the standard classes uh, that uh, everybody, I'm sure everybody is familiar with them one way or another, Schatten von Neumann classes. So uh, they depend on the parameter P. This is a parameter between zero and infinity. Um, I emphasize that any positive number would do. Uh, so we say that the operator belongs to uh, SP class if this sum is finite. Mm -hmm. This is the standard definition, of course. And uh, this quantity defines a norm, uh, which is very useful if P is greater than or equal to one. <clears throat> and then uh, I didn't say that, but probably I should have S1 trace class and S2 is Hilbert Schmidt class, right? And the norm, you remember, I used this definition, used this notation um, in the previous lecture, S1 and S2, norms one and two. Well, uh, the interesting case is actually the one, the non-normed case where you cannot have a norm, but you have a quasi-norm. So if P less than one, then instead of the norm, this quantity defines a quasi-norm, which means that the triangle inequality doesn't hold, but it holds with the constant, right? So there's a constant which is greater than one in the triangle inequality. <clears throat> And nevertheless, uh, the interesting fact is again by Rothfeld and theorem, the one that we had uh, on the other slide, uh, we have the following bound. You see, so we do have some sort of triangle inequality, but it is not for the no for the norm or quasi norm. This is for the for the pth power of this thing. This follows immediately from Rothfeld's theorem on the previous page. It is called P-triangle inequality for obvious reasons. <clears throat> and um, for all practical purposes, this is enough. You don't even need to, to have the norm space. You have to, once you have this triangle inequality, you can do all kinds of analysis. This is something that helps a lot. Now, this, these are uh, complete, um, complete operator spaces with regard to, uh, with respect to the norm in for P greater than or equal to one and with respect to the quasi norm if P is less than one. And uh, if the compact operator is in Schatten von Neumann class, then because this sum is finite, we can immediately say that it is a uh, little low of, of this power of K. So it decays uh, I promised that I would classify operators depending on the rate of decay of their S numbers. So here is the uh, the promise fulfilled. Uh, it, it, it decays faster than this power of K. <clears throat> right. Uh, we actually, we are not going to use these classes um, in what follows. Uh, it is just uh, to give you a perspective on what is available. And the next class is the most important one. So here it decays like a little low of this power. Now the classes that I'm going to look at now, uh, they give you a, a big O of, of the same power. So this, these are weak classes SP, I denote them as P infinity. Uh, <clears throat> in Birman Salamak book, uh, monograph on uh, self-adjoint operators, this class is denoted by Sigma P but I, I wanted to bring it closer to, <coughs> to no, Schatten von Neumann class to use more standard notation here. So this is the class of all compact operators such that their singular values decay as K min, minus one over P, right? And this is big O. And uh, the subclass, a very important one, uh, just to get ahead of the story, let me tell you this, this is <clears throat> a non-separable space of operators. It is non-separable. <clears throat> However, the subclass of operators whose S values decay faster than the same power is separable because you can obtain it as a closure of all operators of finite rank. Closure Closure in what, you may ask, in this norm. This is the uh, norm or quasi-norm 
uh, defined on this um, on the classes sp infinity. <clears throat> of course, it is finite because of the definition. And indeed, uh, the question is, does it define the norm or quasi norm or anything like that? But one thing that I, uh, I should say first, right, I said that this is the closure of finite trunk operators, but the whole thing SP infinity is a complete linear space <coughs> with respect to this norm or quasi norm depending on P. Now let's investigate this question. Is it norm or quasi norm or, or anything at all? So uh, first thing I need to say that this is actually, this, this defines a metric. This quantity defines a metric. You see, if you raise it to power P over P plus one, then it will satisfy uh, the triangle inequality. It's a very useful fact. We will come back to that later. So it is a metric. So we can talk about completeness here. And this is true for all P from zero to infinity. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there are, now we, we will consider separately two cases, P greater than one and P is less than one. In P greater than one, you can find a norm actually. And this norm is defined like that. So uh, this norm is equivalent, and this is the precise constants of this equivalent constants here, one and P, P minus one in the denominator. Uh, they are equivalent. This norm is equivalent to the, uh, to the object that we defined on the previous slide. <clears throat> so it is a normed, uh, it can be considered as a normed space. Uh, I have more details of the proof of this because this is not a difficult proof, but let me just mention the triangle inequality. As you remember on the first slide, I, I wrote this, uh, this bound here. So uh, this bound ensures triangle inequality for this object. These estimates, they are, they are obtained in a relatively straightforward way. Well, you can find them in the book by Birman and Solomek on um, uh, self-adjoint operators in Hilbert spaces. This is a, <clears throat> I would say, classical result. Let me uh, skip the <coughs> case P less than one, P less than one. Now, in this case, uh, it is a bit, um, a bit trickier. Um, P less than one, then this quantity defines a P norm. You see, uh, this is slightly different here. You, you need to take the minimum of T, right? You will have the and SK, and then you have supremum outside over all positive T. This looks a bit complicated, but actually it all works out. <clears throat> then this thing defines uh, defines an equivalent quasi-norm, equivalent with, with the initial one, as you can see it here. And there are also precise constants of equivalence. And this object is actually the p-norm. So it satisfies the triangle inequality <coughs> if raised to power p. And as I have already explained, every time you work with compact operators and you have some sort of triangle inequality, this is already a huge advantage. So you can, you can do whatever you want with that. This replaces triangle inequality without any problems whatsoever. <clears throat> now, what is the proof here? Um, first of all, um, uh, let me just write again this uh, Rothfeld's theorem. It plays the prominent role in the proof, um, especially in the proof of this inequality. If you look at that, and then the, the, to prove this inequality, you just need to choose this function, the concave non-decreasing function in a clever way. So this is how we are going to choose it. Okay. So this is the, the concave non-decreasing function with this condition. And therefore, you, you have your triangle inequality. You just substitute it in there. And then uh, it is multiplied by T 
Um, shall we do that or shall I skip this? I think it is I think it is relatively straightforward here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so triangle inequality follows here. Again, Rothfeld's theorem is, is crucial for this result. This theorem, this proposition is not in Birman and Solanak's book. It is in the paper by, I, I forgot the names. One of those names is Peller. It is uh, in the references that I will give at the very end. Um, for some reason, I didn't give a reference here. I'm, I apologize for that. <coughs> we will come back to this. But this is this is very useful. You see, you have the precise constant here, and uh, I'm going to use the following corollary of this result. If you see that because because of this inequality, I can claim that the initial <coughs> norm or quasi norm uh, satisfies this sort of triangle inequality, but with the with the constant in front. And you see that if p is close to one, this constant can be very large, obviously. Mm -hmm. But this inequality replaces just uh, without any problems for all practical purposes, it replaces the triangle inequality. This is very, very helpful. <clears throat> for example, uh, why is it helpful? For example, if you have a, an operator and then you, um, you cut it in pieces and actually infinitely many pieces if you want to, and then if you want an estimate for the singular values, you just need to estimate each of the species and then put them all together using this inequality. I will illustrate that later. Okay, now, uh, now what about asymptotic? So far, uh, well, of course, I'm in this norm, T, P, infinity, and this is supremum of K one over P, S, K, ugh. It, where is it? It disappears. Okay, let me just write it again. T P infinity supremum over K. Right? If this is finite, you can immediately say that S K is bounded by this K minus minus one over P. Okay, so that's the constant in this bound. <coughs> now, what about asymptotics? We, we will be interested in the asymptotic behavior of eigenvalues, obviously. So we will introduce those functionals. Uh, this is uh, upper limit and lower limit of, of, these, of these objects. Uh, well, uh, upper and lower limit are here because we, um, we want to ensure that both exist. And uh, obviously they satisfy uh, the following inequality. If this is supremum, that the upper limit definitely will be less than. For, <coughs> for convenience, you see, I'm raising this to power P because these functionals will enter some theorems and it will be easier to state them with, with the power P here in contrast to these definitions. Now, if these two objects coincide, if these two limits coincide, then uh, we can talk about asymptotic behavior. Then we say that the eigen uh, singular values of, of the operator T satisfy the following asymptotic formula. So this is what we will be after. We will be after this, <coughs> these functionals for, for compact operators. And then if it turns out at the end of our calculations that these two functionals coincide, we say that we have found and the symptotic formula uh, for the operator T, for the eigenvalues. So that will be the objective for the one particle density matrix in the next lecture. Okay, uh, another observation, which is uh, really straightforward, but let me just remind you that by definition of singular values, you, you have this, right? So if you have the product of T T star, or T star T, and they will give you exactly the same functionals, small g and large g, uh, but with doubled index. <clears throat> this is very useful. You can convert T and T star T into each other all the time using these relations. 
And here is a, a useful fact that uh, probably will, will come in handy on the next slide. Uh, this is a very interesting observation um, relating these functionals with, I mean, with this, with the large, large G, relating this functional with this norm <coughs> or quasi norm. In fact, uh, you, up you can obtain it just by taking infimum over all elements of this <coughs> uh, hang on. of the subset as not. This is the subset of all operators whose singular values decay faster than minus one over P. Okay, so SKR decay faster than that. Or if you would like, you can replace this R by finite dimensional operators. And then the infimum will be exactly this. Okay, so it is sort of a factor norm, in fact. I'm not going to explore this, but this is a useful point of view. You can consider it as a factor quasi norm um, on the space of, on the factor space S P infinity S mm -hmm. not P infinity. Okay. But as I said, I'm not going to explore this. Uh, but it's a useful fact to remember anyway. <clears throat> now, uh, you remember the inequality that I mentioned for the functional, for the norm one minus P minus one, and then the sum Tj, this is P, P, P infinity. <clears throat> okay, this is sort of triangle inequality. And uh, this functional also satisfies the same sort of inequality. Mm -hmm. And this is why I mentioned that approximation by operators from sp infinity not because you can obtain this inequality from this one just by using this uh, approximation on the previous slide that it is a factor um, semi-norm <coughs> quasi-norm excuse me factor quasi-norm on the space notice that here i assume that uh, this sum converges so this is the norm Oh, quasi-norm, sorry. Uh, this is not the, the convergence of the right-hand side here. I assume more than that, okay? And then you have this inequality. And again, this is very useful because um, if you have um, an operator and you indeed cut it into infinitely many pieces or finitely many, then you need to estimate this quantity. You just need to estimate each individual quantity on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. This is what I will be using uh, in the next lecture. Um, the next property of these functionals is continuity. That is also a very crucial property. Uh, notice that this property follows from, uh, uh, from a similar triangle inequality for, for this metric. You remember it was on one of the first slides. This satisfied the triangle inequality. The same here, you see, it's already raised to power P in the definition. So you just need to take this, this is P here. You just need P plus one downstairs. <clears throat> this is continuity. It looks very unpretentious. So what? We have an inequality that follows from the properties of the metric, but look at the consequences. This is first corollary. How do you find this kind of coefficient, this kind of asymptotics for the for for the for a compact operator? You can approximate this operator by something to ensure that uh, the functional for the difference between your approximation and your initial operator is zero. And then you can claim immediately from these two inequalities that the asymptotic behavior of these two operators will be the same. 
this is a, a very, very useful fact. In other words, and if t, t1 minus 2 is in S naught P infinity, then you have this and you have that. <coughs> okay? That's an extremely useful fact, which is used in the asymptotic analysis all the time. And I will be referring to this fact, <coughs> excuse me, uh, very often. And the second corollary is even um, more useful sometimes. Have a look at that. Um, so it is, it is using this, these two inequalities as well, but um, in a slightly more complicated way. Now, I do not assume that this is equal to zero, but I assume that this difference tends to zero. Well, you, you can actually write an approximation such that this difference tends to zero when the parameter of approximation tends to its limits, to its limit. It is zero chosen in this corollary parameter, right? So if this tends to zero, then uh, once you found the asymptotic coefficient for the operator T nu, right? So all you need to do is to find those asymptotic functionals for the operators T nu for the approximation, right? And then you know from this corollary, you will see immediately that this asymptotic functionals, these functionals will have a limit when nu tends to zero. Okay, so this is the consequence of this simple fact that we know that when we approximate by something, then these functionals have a limit. And this is exactly what will help us to show, you remember on the previous slide, I said that all these functions eta, we have no information about them, but from this standard abstract asymptotic fact, we will conclude that those functions eta, they belong to this L three quarters. You remember what I mentioned in the previous lecture. <clears throat> because these limits exist. That's the, that's the crucial bit. Okay. Singular value. So these are, I think these are the last two slides on this. Um, <clears throat> and then there will be a list of references. I will comment on that very briefly. So I will be using two facts. Um, they have classical and quite old facts. You see 1977 um, from, the, from the theory of integral operators. And I will be using the bounds for singular values of integral operators obtained by Birman and Solomiak. <clears throat> and operators in question are these. So we have an operator acting from L2 lambda. Okay, uh, lambda here is probably C. This is what I want to say, okay? So lambda is C. I, uh, for some reason, left the uh, didn't edit this out. So lambda is the cube, <clears throat> the same as C. This is the unit cube in d-dimensional space. This is the operator acting between the cube and uh, L2 on Rn. And this operator has the kernel and of course the weights. So these are the weights. Uh, what, can we, uh, what can we say about singular values of this operator? And here is what we can say. We, they, they depend on the smoothness of the kernel, of this kernel. They do not depend on the smoothness of weights. Weights do not matter here. They can be just L2 or L2 local functions, but the kernel needs to be HL. So this is the standard. I don't know if you, what notation you prefer. This is this notation. <coughs> and L should be, relatively large, right? So, so, so double L is greater than D. This is for the, <clears throat> for the embedding theorems for almost all T. This is smoothness in one single variable X. You don't need smoothness in two variables for this result. Mm -hmm. And then you have the following, uh, the following estimate. So this operator is compact and its eigenvalues are bounded by this. This is how fast they decay. This is one half, this is exactly the exponent here, one half plus L over D with minus sign. And this is the coefficient. 
You see, it depends on the weights, and it also depends on the norm of the kernel as the function in HL. The constant doesn't depend yes. on K. Yep. There are no conditions on the uh, on the dependence of a uh, large T on K. I don't say any condition. Uh, could you please repeat what you just said? Uh, uh, and how uh, uh, T uh, capital depends on T small, on, on small T. This is in a, a, well. Uh, this is L two. This is what it is. This is L two. I'm I'm sorry. Indeed, you're right. Uh, this is a good point. Mm -hmm. So this is what's it written? L two, R n, um, H L, and C, or lambda. This is lambda. Okay. This is C. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it should be H two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it should be H2 with this weight, more precisely. So mm -hmm. it is H2 local, uh, sorry, L2 local. And with this weight, it should be finite. So that this coefficient is finite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for this point. I, uh, for somehow, somehow I missed that. I should include this. The constant here, <clears throat> of course there is a constant and it is independent on the operator, on the kernel T independent of the kernel T, of the label K, and of the weights A and B. So this is a universal constant. Uh, well, this is just another way of writing the same fact, right? So the norm, uh, or quasi-norm, in, <coughs> in S Q infinity of operator T is bounded by this. We will need this inequality only for integer L, although non-integer L, Ls are also allowed, <coughs> but we don't need this at all. Okay, so that's, that's a fundamental result. Notice that the smoother the kernel is, the faster eigenvalues or singular values decay. So if you have, for example, a real analytic kernel, it will be just superpower decay, all right? So this will allow us uh, in our considerations, in our calculations to say, here is the kernel, we split it in the bits. <coughs> I haven't talked for two weeks, for such a long time. So we will split it in the bits and we say, this one is real analytic, this one is C infinity, this one is something else. So they do not matter. Their, eigen, uh, their singular values decay very fast. And you remember from the previous slide, if singular values decay too fast, then you can just ignore those operators when you compute asymptotic coefficients. So let me just show you this, All right? So this corollary here, this one, <clears throat> we can ignore them or we can use this but this is already a bit more complicated, right? So this, allow, this fact here that smoothness depends, uh, smoothness determines the rate of decay of singular values allows us to throw out the operators that are smooth for us, whose kernels are smooth. They do not contribute to the answer. We keep only those that have some singularity in them, okay? This is what will matter. <clears throat> And what kind of asymptotic formula we can write, um, right? So, so far we've been talking about uh, estimates. Now, this is the asymptotic formula. So we have an operator T uh, between, again, between two bounded. Uh, now it doesn't have to be a cube. It just two barrel sets. It can be anything. And the kernel that we will be interested in is this. Look at this kernel. So there are weights here. <coughs> and there is also a function that depends on both variables. And this function is supposed to be smooth, right? Just for simplicity, it doesn't have to be C infinity, but for the sake of this theorem, let me assume that it is. And I will also assume that both weights are bounded. Again, <coughs> It doesn't have to be this way, but again, to make it simple, assume that. 
Now, as I said, when we want to determine the asymptotics of the S numbers or singular values for um, compact integral operator, we are looking for singularities. And these terms do not have any singularities, but this one does, right? So this is x minus alpha to uh, x minus y to alpha. It may have singularity at zero and it will have singularity at zero if alpha is negative. So that is the term that determines the decay, uh, the <coughs> spectral asymptotics of the operator T, okay? This is again the result by Birman and Solomiak from 77. Actually, this particular result is from 1970. There were generalizations published in 77 and 79. So here is the result. Now, uh, first of all, there is a spectral asymptotic formula, asymptotics formula. So both functionals coincide, the lower and the upper limit, as you can see. And the coefficient is given by the integral over the diagonal, right? So the diagonal, this is where singularity happens, right? So this is the philosophy behind all that. Whatever happens on the diagonal will determine the rate of decay. And here we have it, right? This is the diagonal. Again, x and the, these two variables coincide here. This is the diagonal. And then we integrate and get the asymptotic coefficient. Uh, what is P? <clears throat> P is exactly this. This is, so uh, one over P, I'm writing it like that. It is always better for me to write it using proper fraction notation. Uh, alpha over D, um, right. Coefficient mu, uh, if alpha is away from those values, well, of course, if alpha equals zero, there is no singularity. If alpha equals even power, then there is no singularity. So uh, this coefficient will be zero, right? The eigenvalues decay fast, the singular values, as I explained to you on the previous slide. You remember, the smoother the kernel is, the faster singular values decay. So uh, when you have a singularity, so when indeed this is not um, a smooth function, this one, then you have non-trivial asymptotic coefficient. It is non-trivial, it doesn't look trivial at all, but you know, uh, for our purposes, we can always calculate it and find the values that I uh, showed to you in the previous lecture. By the way, so uh, this is the end of the mathematics part. The next, the next slide will be references, but just for the sake of fun, let's see. You remember what I wanted. I wanted these two functionals for the, uh, for the operator psi. You remember this P was three quarters because the uh, singular values decayed <clears throat> as K minus four thirds. You remember it is one over P, so P is three quarters, okay? One over P is four thirds. What kind of alpha do I need to get four thirds if I am to use this theorem? Okay, so the dimension is three, right? So this is, uh, you remember the operator x hat x, x is three dimensional variable. So it is dimension three. Uh, what alpha do I need? I need four thirds here. This is one over p, one plus alpha over three. I need alpha to be equal to one, <clears throat> right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need alpha equals one. Do I have it? Colon. I do, I do have it because you remember that representation, Psi. <coughs> <coughs> this X, okay, uh, let me start here below. X hat X equals Psi x hat x j plus x minus x j eta j x hat x. Uh -huh. You remember that one from the previous slide or from the previous lecture? Yes. I do have power one here. 
Okay, this is exactly that singularity with alpha equals one. <clears throat> and that will produce for me uh, this decay, minus four thirds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the, the main, uh, the, the main reason why we have four thirds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the time here? Right, another thing I wanted to say, <clears throat> just um, uh, bear with me for a few more minutes, I, um, that uh, if you, so asymptotics is okay, we need alpha equals one and we have it. But what about this theorem? Do we get the right estimate if we have integer L? Look at that. So uh, if we have integer L, we will need to get, we need this sort of estimate, right? We need this sort of thing. Oops, excuse me, let me just start here. I, I'm rushing now, I should stop worrying about this. Look at this. We need, uh, this Q is what we denoted by P on the next slide. So this is going to be four thirds. So I repeat, instead of the asymptotics that we got on the next slide, now I'm looking for a bound. Can we get the right bound from this theorem? Okay, what do I need? What L do I take to get the right bound? We need one over Q four thirds, and then we need to equate this to L over three. Now, <clears throat> some silly calculation is going to happen here. This is three six, and this is two L over six, right? So what do we need? For L, we need two and a half, right? So we need to take the derivative of order two and a half. Of course, it is not unheard of to have derivatives of fractional order. This is the, now the whole theory is behind that, no problem. But I do not have bounds for um, eigenfunctions with derivatives of um, non-integer order. So I will have to use the bounds, this is kind of a, a preview of what is going to happen, a spoiler, what is going to happen in lecture three. To get two and one half, I will use the bounds, this bounds, <clears throat> for two and three, for L equals two and L equals three. And then using some, <clears throat> as I think, clever trick, I will get the right bound with four thirds, right? The same that the one I would have obtained if I had had estimates with fractional derivatives. Okay, this is the spoiler. I will repeat all that again next time, right? I just wanted to say it now so that it kind of <coughs> falls on the, on the ground, so to speak. And now let me show to you the references. This is the paper that I meant. This is for, for P less than one. This is where one gets, see, interesting class of operators with unusual Schatten von Neumann behavior. This is the class, this is exactly that weak class here. <clears throat> this is a papers by Bierman and Salamak, the ones that I'm referring to. And uh, this is the paper where I get estimates using that clever technique. And I will show you this list maybe next time again. All right. Uh, now I'm stop share. I stop sharing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So that's the end of it <coughs> for today. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. It was great. Mm -hmm. Thank was you very great. much. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, so next time, Thursday, ten o'clock. Right. I mean, one o'clock. Your time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think timing is good. Right. Timing is good, around uh, almost exactly two hours. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks all. And uh, well, you. Катя, uh... потом обсуждать все это. Катя, еще в говорю, пока не отключилась. Okay, but uh, but we are going to have a, a little uh, chat anyway when mm -hmm. after that. <clears throat> okay, everybody. Uh, I uh, you've been a wonderful audience. You didn't disturb me a single time. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe you, I mean, I will be so happy to answer questions if you have any.
Ben, do you want to, have to ask a question? Ben, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, hello. No, you can. Yes. OK. <clears throat> I would like to thank you for the good presentation. Oh, thank you very I, much. Yeah. Yes, I happen to be a student <coughs> at Mara University of Science and Technology. And I'm in my year Which two one? research. Which Barara, one? Invest, Barara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. Oh, OK. So yes, you are in I'm, Uganda now? I'm in Uganda now, yes. Goodness, I see. I'm, All over <laughs> yes, the place I'm, we are, yes. <laughs> yes, and I happen to be working on screening operators, magnetic screening operator, and I'm looking at the number of negative eigenvalues. Today's presentation has been good. I thank really you. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> and I, will, I hope to see you on Thursday, and then if you if you come back. <clears throat> I'll be grateful to be there on Thursday. Thank you. OK, good. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, well, everybody is free to leave if you if there are no questions. А можно я по-русски вопрос задам? Прошу вас, сделайте себя видимой, пожалуйста. Видимой, ладно. Только не пугайтесь. Вот, в общем, у меня вопрос по концу по концу прошлой лекции. Вы вы там написали, вы писали там оценки, конструировали там оценки через функцию это. Там вот когда когда у двухчастичная система, там просто там просто через это. Когда трехчастичная, там вы сконструировали функцию, которая лежит в нужном вам вам классе, как-то там возводя две разные это в степень и интегрируя. А если частиц больше, там что там вот не 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 одна вторая степень, а одна третья, одна четвертая и так далее, или или еще как-то неизвестно ничего. Большое спасибо за вопрос. Это дает мне возможность вернуться к моим предыдущим слайдам. Где это? Вот это вот оно, да? Да, да. Вы видите это да, сейчас, да? Да, да. Когда частиц больше, когда n больше, чем 3, это вот то, что мы имеем в виду, то тогда надо брать... Что тогда? Тогда надо брать n1, и t1, и t2, и t3, и t n minus 1. Окей, mm -hmm. okay, so n minus 1. Так, n minus 1, это, это, это уже по-английски. So, это n без единицы, вот так. <coughs> и тогда mm -hmm. вот, ну и тогда вот мы вот то, то же самое делаем, правильно? То есть для этого 1 мы берем x, x. Для это 2 мы берем, а, а, что мы берем? Мы берем... А, x точка. на втором месте здесь точка, здесь угу. точка, здесь x. На втором месте x. Для угу. это 3 мы берем точка, точка, x, точка, x. То есть последний всегда x. Угу. А в зависимости от номера it мы выбираем номер переменной. Ну вот для третьей это будет третья, для четвертой четвертая, для n на n минус первая. Понятно. Да. да. И потом мы вот строим вот такую же вещь. Здесь это один в квадрате, потом все они суммируются. Это, это j от единицы до n минус единицы. Все суммируются вот таким образом. Угу. То есть квадрат сохраняется, то есть степень квадрат. та же самая. Угу. По, по t, вот, вот, по, не по t, а вот по тем переменным, которые вот, вот тут стоят. Которые лишние. Ну, понятно, которые да. лишние, да. То есть, понимаете, вот и формулировка, она возможна, но вот тут надо учесть, что вы уже две переменных выкинули. Угу. Вот, вот эту и вот эту. И то, что осталось, это уже будет что? 2n, так, n, 3n минус, вот, чего? 6, да? 3n минус 6 переменных. Вот по ним по всем интегрированию идет. Угу. Вот проинтегрировали, извлекли корень и получили функцию h. А дальше уже все то же самое. Понятно. То есть, все то с есть степени те же самые. То есть, да, все угу. с квадратами. То есть нет проблем. То есть все то же самое. Единственное, почему я не хотел это делать, это потому что надо было вот как-то вот, вот, вот этих вот, вот это все объяснить. Вот тут. Все эти переменные. 
Хорошо. А для двух частиц, конечно, вот это ничего не надо. Ну, То есть этот интеграл да. лишний. Угу. Можно делать только вот это. Ясно, спасибо. спасибо. Вам спасибо за вопрос. Окей. Угу. Okay. Хорошо. Ну, до свидания. Было очень интересно. Спасибо вам. Спасибо. Всего хорошего. To all English-speaking um, English people, I, I apologize. I mean, sometimes uh, we uh, we have to say a few words in uh, in Russian, but uh, otherwise, I hope that it was all clear. Okay, thank you very much.